Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in Brief Moment. Lux presents Hollywood. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your loyalty to Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, a loyalty which makes it possible for our sponsors to bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Our program tonight features Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in brief moments with Nigel Bruce, Louis Calhern, and Paul Harvey. We're also host to Jimmy Starr, noted Hollywood columnist. Louis Silvers directs our music. And now... Our program opens with word from our producer, that celebrated personality. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. I don't understand you. Don't you? I suppose you realize that this girl has fallen in love with you. Who said so? Your mother told me. She's quite worried about it. Ridiculous. Perhaps, but I'm not interested in that. What I want to know is, are you in love with her? Angela. Are you, Mac? Of course not. Whatever puts such nonsense into your head? The only reason I'm interested in this girl is that she can supply me with material for my novel. Well, I just wanted to make sure, Mac, because, well, people are beginning to talk. I don't see why. No? You think this creature of yours is an innocent young lamb, don't you? A tender flower blooming in the slums. Well, she isn't. What? She isn't. I've taken the trouble to find out. Do you suppose that the night you found her in the court was the first time she'd been arrested? You... you mean she's been arrested before that? Of course. On what charge? Suppose we call it... Here was out. But to make it more sure, she adds, I boiled an egg hard and took out the yolk and filled it with salt. And when I went to bed, I ate it, shell and all, without speaking or drinking after it. I certainly hope that the girl got the boy. She earned him. And I trust our observance of St. Valentine's Day will prove more enjoyable. The presentation of Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in the romantic play, Brief Moment. Down the street from our theater is the RKO Studio, which claims the services of both Miss Rogers and Mr. Fairbanks, whom you'll soon see together in the picture Having Wonderful Time. Ginger at the moment is making Vivacious Lady, and after that starts dancing with Fred Astaire in a new musical. Doug has just finished co-starring with Irene Dunn in Joy of Living, and shortly he and Cary Grant begin Gunga Din. Tonight... He's Roderick Dean, and Miss Rogers is Abby in S.N. Berman's notable success of stage and screen. Brief Moment also brings us Louis Calhoun as Cass Worthing and Paul Harvey as Manny Walsh, both from the original New York cast, while Nigel Bruce, long familiar as a figure on the stage and screen in this country and England, is heard as Seagriff. The footlights flash on. Louis Silver's baton is raised as the curtain rises in the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in brief moment. It's a grim, cold winter morning. The street windows of the Apex Lunchroom in Pittsburgh are white with frost. In the tiled interior of the overheated restaurant, a waitress stands at the cashier's desk, balancing a tray on one hand as she leans across the counter. Anything yet, Mabel? Huh? Did a telegram come for me? Say, what is this? You expecting good news or something? Well, I'm expecting something. Hey, sister, what about those eggs over easy? All right, all right, give me a chance. Well, snap it up. Let me know if something comes, will you, Mabel? Okay, I'll let you know. Check it up, chef. Oatmeal at number three. Hey, Gertie. What, Abby? There's a guy in there who wants two eggs over easy. If you can deliver, you might get that nickel tip. Oh, deliver yourself. I got my own troubles. Say, what's the matter with you anyway? You've been moping around here all week with a face a mile long. Oh, I'm fed up with this place. I'm fed up with the grease, and I'm fed up with the people who eat it. I've got a cold in the head, and I feel rotten. And I'm going to get out of here before I brain somebody with a platter. Two eggs over easy. Two eggs. You mean you're going to quit, Abby? I hope so. Oh, you're crazy. Where are you going? I'm going to New York. I'm waiting for a wire now from Manny Walsh. Manny Walsh? The guy that used to drive a hack around here? Well, he don't drive a hack anymore. He's a big shot there. He owns a nightclub. I suppose that makes you a chorus girl in the floor show. And what's so funny about that? Huh? You mean it? Sure, I wrote him a week ago. He's a friend of my pops. He'll do something for me. Yeah? Yeah. Two eggs, so over easy. Here, watch that platter, it's hot. Okay. 
Meanwhile, I'm still hustling bees. Hey, Abby. What? Uh, I was just coming in after you. Something did come. Look, a telegram. Oh, gee, gee, open it quick. I got my hands full. All right. You know, I thought you was kidding well, or well, something. Well, what does it say? Quick. Hey, what about those eggs? Mm-hmm. Here it is. Holding job open. Anxious to see a man. Oh, I knew it. I knew he'd come through. Hey, sister, I can't wait all day. Oh, you can as far as I'm concerned. Hey! Come so on, Mabel. I'm on my way. Bain, it's that door over there. You can go right in. He's expecting you. Thanks. Hello, Manny. Abby. Gee, Abby, it's swell to see you. Come in. <laughs> Thanks. I've been waiting for you. Let me look at you. Say you look all right. Sit down. <laughs> well, just get in? Yeah. I just came over from the station. Well, I uh, won't take up any more of your time, Manny. Oh, yeah. Abby, this is Cass Worthing. This is Abby Faincast, daughter of an old friend of mine. How do you do? How are you? Your first visit to New York? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I was here when I was a kid. I don't remember much about it, though. Well, anything I can do for you? Oh, thanks. Goodbye, Miss Fain. So long, Manny. Yeah. Who is he? Society guy. Polo player, mostly, but he thinks he's pretty hot at stud poker, too. He was just in paying off. Oh, Gee, gee, it's a nice place you got here, Manny. Nothing to what I'm going to have. I'm going up and up, Abby, all the way. <laughs> so you want a job, huh? Yeah. I can sing a little and I can dance. I'm best at singing, I guess. Sure. I'll get one of the kids in the line to teach you the routines and all. If you make out okay, we'll move you up. Oh, gee, I don't know how to thank you, Manny. What for? Oh, give me a break without even knowing what I can do. Oh, I don't have to know it. You're a sweet kid. That's what counts in this racket. And as long as you stay a sweet kid, you'll be okay. Yeah. I get it. Oh, boss. Yeah? That guy Worthing had some flowers sent up. They're for the lady. Me? Yeah. Here you are. Well, thanks. (sighs) (laughs) Gee, that was kind of nice of him, wasn't it? Yeah. It was okay. Listen to this in the scandal column. What new chorus girl at the Hotsy Totsy has caught the eye of what socialite polo player? I'll bet it's Cass again. <laughs> I'll bet you're right. Have you seen this? Abby Fain has been moved out of the chorus line at the Hotsy Totsy. The three gold men at the four table is all smiles. Hmm. The way you wear your hat, the way you sip your the memory of all that. Well, there she is, Rod. Did I brag out of turn? Oh, decidedly not, Cass. Pure understatement, if anything. She's beautiful. What do you think of her, Sig? Sig! Wake him up, will you, Cass? <laughs> <laughs> Say, Sig! What? what do you think of her? At the moment, I was not to give her a toll. I hope you don't mind. No, go back to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. <laughs> Sig's an intellectual, Cass. A fat, lazy intellectual. Not fat, please. Stout. <laughs> <laughs> She's coming over. Oh, hello, Cass. Hello, Abby. Sit down. Oh, uh, this is Roderick Dean, Abby. Oh, hello. How do you do? And Harold Seagrift. Good evening. How are you? Not at all well, thank you. I'd better apologize for Sig in advance, Miss Fane. He's very rude. Just ignore me. All right. We heard your number, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Mr. Dean. I'll have to thank Cass for bringing us. I'm sorry I didn't know about it sooner. Oh, oh, watch out for this fellow, Abby. Don't believe a word he says. He's no good. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Too much money, no ambition. Is ambition one of your virtues, Cass? Yeah, well, at least I play polo. Rod doesn't even do that. A perfectly useless character, I'm warning you, Abby. I don't believe you. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid he's right. Well, we'd better get along, Sig. We've got a lot of places to cover tonight. Oh, no, 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 Rod. Come on. Good night, Miss Fane. Good night. Night, Cass. Good night. Now, listen, Rod, if you think I'm going trips, you're going from one nightclub to another. You're... Quiet, Sig. It's early. <laughs> Crazy guy. He seems nice. Oh, I guess he's all right. I, I only brought him here to show you off to him. Oh, yes. <laughs> listen, a certain well-known polarist is still holding hands with a certain torch singer. <laughs> His friends are very much surprised. 
happy wedding bells over at the Hotsy Totsy. Abby Payne is choosing her trousseau, but he chooses not to talk. Hmm, we're still wondering. Manny, listen to this. That socialite is now en route for Europe, and that torch singer is really singing blue. I ought to go over there and find that guy. I ought to punch him right in the snoot. Oh, stop it, Manny. It's all over. Forget it. Will you, Abby? I'll get over it. You can get over anything in time. You were pretty daffy about that bird, weren't you? I guess so. Abby, I, 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 I wish I could do something. Oh, you've done everything, Manny. I'd still be slinging beans back in Pittsburgh if it weren't for you. I wasn't thinking about that. What I meant was, well, when you take a rap like this, it helps sometimes. If you, oh, oh I know I ain't much of a bargain, but I, Abby, Abby. What? What, Manny? Oh, I'm sorry. What was it you said? Nothing. Try and snap out of it. Oh, I'll be all right. I'll pull out of it, and you'll never know the difference. Sure, you'll be okay. <laughs> nice night, boss. We ain't got a table left. Yeah. Oh, uh, see, Abby? In a dressing room, I guess. Oh, Oh, hello, Manny. Hello. What's on your mind? Nothing much. There, I see that guy's here again. Who? Oh, you, what's his name? Roderick Dean. Oh, Rod. I thought... Oh, yes, Rod said he was coming tonight. You got a friend with him. Fat guy. Well, that's Sig, I guess. And that Dean guy's been showing up pretty regular the last couple of months. Well, that makes him one of your best customers. Not if he's like his pal, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't want to see you get burned again, Abby. Oh, don't worry. Rod's all right. Uh-huh. Well, he looks okay. Of course, it's none of my business, Rod, but just why do you want to marry her? Very simple. I adore her. You don't have to marry her to adore her. I think adoration alone would bore Abby. I couldn't hold her with it, and I've got to hold her. It's important for me, sir. Important? A blues singer in a nightclub? Oh, you're a snob, that's all. The girl's magnificent. Her vitality is magnificent. After all, who am I? A millionaire's son? Well, what of it? The town's rotten with them. I've been a failure at everything. A complete washout. And don't think I don't know it. Will the prima donna of the Hotsy Totsy Club change all that? No, I don't say she will. All I say is it's no concession for me to marry her. She may turn me down flat. If she turns you down, Rod, then I'm Skippy. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. I'm Manny Walsh. Yes, we met before, I think. That's right. This is uh, Harold Sigrift. How do you do? How are you? Mr. Dean, I I'd like to speak to you a minute. We can go in my office if you want. No, we can stay here. Sig, didn't you say you had a call to make? No, not that I remember. Oh, go on, Sig, be pleasant. Do I have to move? Surely, Mr. Walsh, you can talk in front of baby. You can spell out the big words. <laughs> Sorry, it's personal. Oh, very well. Why was I doomed to live in so giddy an age? <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Walsh. Thanks. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I wanted to speak to you about Abby. Yes? She means a lot to me, Mr. Dean. It's a sympathy we share. Cigarette? Thanks. She'll probably give me blazes if she finds out I talked to you. Better not tell her. Are you afraid of her? No, not exactly afraid, except, uh, well, Abby's the first dame that ever got the best of me. How? That's it. I don't know. Nothing she does. Only I feel she knows everything I'm thinking, but that I don't know everything she's thinking. Is Abby mysterious? I never got that impression. Maybe not, but she buffaloes me. Funny, too because we've been pretty good friends. I mean, well, uh, I've always tried to sort of look after, you know? Yes. That's what you're doing now, aren't you? Huh? You don't know me very well. We've only met once or twice. You're here to give me the once-over. That's it, isn't it? Well, if you want to put it that way, yes. Of course. I'm very decent of you. It's just that I wanted to feel sure that she ain't making a mistake. <laughs> well, do I pass? Yeah. I guess so. Thanks. I mean, well, you look all right anyhow. Say, so she's 
coming out for her number. I, I better beat it. Will, will you be seeing her later? I imagine so. She was coming up to my place. Well, don't say anything about me speaking to you. I won't. Bottle up and don't be blue. All your fears All right. <laughs> yes. It seems kind of funny to go up in an elevator 30 flights and then climb two more. It's the curse of living in a penthouse. <laughs> Here we are. Go ahead. Lights on your left. Well, what do you think of the place? Oh, gee, it's so high my ears hurt. <laughs> <laughs> you like it? Swell. Well, it's empty most of the time. Cigarettes on the table. Thanks. <sighs> well, sweetheart, what's the answer? To what? You know to what. When I asked you to marry me the other night, you said you wanted a day to think it over. That's right, I did. Oh, have you thought? No. Not another day? No. I was stringing you. What? I knew all the time I'd say yes. Really? Mm -hmm. You mean it, Abby? Mm -hmm. Come here. Oh, I can't tell you what it was like waiting. The delay was just technique. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, what did Manny want? Huh? Well, I saw him speaking to you at the club. Oh, well, we just dropped in for a chat. Now, Manny's no chatter. What did he have to say? Well, his mission was very generous, really. He uh, he wanted to give me the once-over. Really? Do you think you got by? Well, I think I passed. But I have a feeling he'll want to speak to me again. In fact, I'm practically certain. Almost as certain as the feeling I have about you. You know, sometimes I feel you're kidding. The way you talk. Oh, well, not to me alone, but... In general. Well, that's a defense. I have to kid about things. Why? Because I'm not sure of them. Or of myself. Well, I don't get you, Rod. You're young, you're rich, you're attractive. You've got everything in the world. And yet... What? I'm afraid if I say it, it'll, it'll sound ridiculous. Well, what if it does? Go on, say it. Well, I'm very introspective, I suppose. What does that mean? Well, I think about myself. Well, so do I. All the time, I love it. Well, that's different. I, I think of myself in relation to the outside world, to life, and I, I seem to myself to be so highly unnecessary. I'm surrounded by successful people, all of them much more talented than I am. I've tried art, I've tried writing songs, well, I've tried... Well, what of it? Tin Pan Alley. If you knew the mugs I know who are hits in Tin Pan Alley... No, that's not the point. The point is that Tin Pan Alley does express them. I'm unemployed spiritually. I'm, well... I'm simply trying to convey to you that you're marrying a failure. Oh, don't say that, Rod. You'll be a success with me. I think so, too. But you've got to help me. I've gone from one thing to another. I can't find base. You, you've got to help me. Of course I will. You're everything I'm not, Abby. I love you for it. Same here. Look at me. You're beautiful, Ed. Beautiful. Rod. What, darling? I... I can't do it. I, I can't go through with it, Rod. I thought I could, but it's no use. What do you mean? I can't marry you. Why not? Because I've, I've got nothing to offer you. Not a thing. Well, you less, must let me be the judge of that. Well, you see, I, I'm not in love with you, Rod. I see. Well, you're fond of me, aren't you? Yes. You're too good to be true. Well, I'll take that for a start. No, no, no. It's more than that. It's that I... Well, I don't want to fall in love again. As, as far as that sort of thing is concerned, I'm... Well, I'm willing to call it a day. Is it Cassworthy? Yes. Well, I got over it all right. It had killed me, but I finally did. I thought when I... When you started to call me, well, it, it seemed so nice. and I didn't know there were men like you. I guess I thought this was a way out for me. Security, independence. That's what I thought... That's the lowdown, Rod. But you're too nice for that. You, you, you can do better than that. I advise you to pass it up, Rod. Do you? Yes, Rod. But Worthing, is, is it over? Yes. Really over? Are you sure? Well, you get to a point where you don't feel anything anymore. Well, then I hope you'll never mention it again. I don't see how I could expect you to organize your past as a kind of prelude to my appearance, a kind of prolonged entrance music. If we can organize the future, we'll be doing pretty well. You mean... You mean 
After what I just said? Yes, Abby. Oh, Rod, I... I'm a failure, too, in a way. I... <laughs> we can comfort each other. Or draw strength from each other. The things I can give you don't really count. But you'll have all my love, Abby. And I hope that someday I'll have yours. Well, is it a deal? Yes. It's a deal. <laughs> One brief moment, starring Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. During the short intermission, with the assistance of two ladies from our audience here in the Lux Radio Theater, we're going to play a game. It's fun for everybody, so we invite our radio audience to join us. I'm going to mention two words, each of which has more than one meaning. How many meanings can you think of for each of these words? We'll start with the young lady in the blue dress. Your name, please. Helen Murphy. Occupation? Stenographer. Address? 412 North Camarillo Street, Hollywood. Can you give us three meanings for the word fresh? Well, fresh, um, let's see. Fruit is fresh when it isn't canned, and fresh can mean smart alecky, like a boy uh, gets fresh as paint. Yes, I guess they do sometimes. A third meaning. Let's see. Fresh can mean sweet and dainty, like... Like um, uh, silk things after they're luxed? <laughs> perfect example. Now for our second contestant. Name, occupation, and address. Mrs. Anderson... I, I'm a housewife, and I live in Laurel Canyon, Hollywood. The word is fade, F-A-D-E. Can you give us three meanings for the word fade? Fade? Let's see. Uh, well, sound can fade away, and fade is a term you use in football, like fade back for a pass. Did you say your occupation was housewife? Or can you give us a third meaning for fade? Why, why yes, colors may fade, too. But I find that if they're safe in water, they're safe in luck. You're a housewife, all right, and a clever one. One of the many reasons so many women stick to Lux flakes is that they don't fade colors. This is especially important in the case of underthings, because, of course, fastidious women wash these after each wearing. Lux not only freshens them, leaves them absolutely dainty, but also leaves the color and the fabric new-looking. So always wash underthings with Lux flakes. And now, back to Mr. DeMille. Brief moment, starring Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., with Nigel Bruce, Louis Calhoun, and Paul Harvey. Six months have gone by, and Abby is married to Roderick Dean. There's little left of the nightclub singer. In her place as a woman, refined and cultured, at least to the casual observer. In a fashionable shop on Fifth Avenue... She sits at a long counter, placing an order for gloves. I'll take these two pairs, please. Yes, madam. And the gray. Do you know where to send them? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Roderick Dean, isn't it? Well, Cass, <laughs> well. Uh, that'll be all, please. Yes, madam. How are you, Cass? Well, how are you? Much better, thanks. Oh, I, uh, I was right about the name. Oh, eh? yes. I've been married for about six months now. Yes, I heard about it. I just got back yesterday. <laughs> well, you're looking well, Abby. Thank you. Funny you my running into you. I was going to give you a ring tonight. Were you? Well, you saved yourself a nickel. <laughs> Could we have some tea? Oh, I'm afraid not, Cass. Uh, dinner, perhaps? No, it's impossible. We're having friends. Oh. Oh, not that you aren't. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, I've got to run. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, when am I going to see you? Oh, well, we're having a party a week from Thursday. Oh, not before then. Well, of course. Give me a ring, Cass. <laughs> all right, all right, I will. <laughs> Mrs. Dean? Yes, Louise. Mr. Worthing is here. Oh. Oh, well, ask him to come in. Ah, uh, Cass? Hello, Cass. Uh, you know you weren't due here tonight, you know. Oh, I always make it a point to be early. Oh, well, sit down. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, who was that heavily bearded gent I passed on the way in? Oh, I guess you mean uh, Sergei. Sergei Valoshin. He's a moving picture director. Oh, Hollywood? <laughs> yes, and points west. He's, he's Russian. <laughs> yes, I gathered that. What was he doing, tempting you with offers? Oh, hardly. I met him at a party a few weeks ago. He's very interesting. I asked him to drop up for tea and... <laughs> this is like a relay race. Lucky for you, you're married to a nut like Roderick Dean. I beg your pardon. Russian movie directors. No sane man would stand for it. Anything else, Cass? Yes? Why didn't you show up yesterday? I told you I couldn't. But you didn't say why. Have you forgotten the name is Dean now, Mr. Worthing? I think I know what's the matter with you, Abby. 
You've gone lady on me. You were much more amusing in the old days. I don't believe that. In the old days, as you so fondly called them, you took me very casually. Now I must say you're a little more attentive. Contradictory, isn't it? Abby, you're bitter. No, I don't think I am. You can't forgive me, but I'll make you. And when you have, you'll forget that you ever resented me. Now you're getting complicated. That's not your style. Abby, you know why I mean more to you than anybody. Really? Husband or no husband. Why? Because you know what we were to each other. I hardly remember. I don't believe you. It's another life, Cass, dear. It's the same life, Abby. You're my kind. You're more like me than anybody. No, Cass. I used to think I was like you. I used to try to be like you. I'm changed now. What changed you? You partly. Roderick Dean, mostly. You see, I'm trying to be like him now. And you've forgotten me? Completely. You're a liar, Abby. Mr. Worthing. I know, and you know. It's just the same as it always was. No, Cass, believe me, it isn't. Oh, it isn't, eh? Well, I'll show you. Cass, behave yourself. Abby! Behave, do you hear? Let me go, let me... Cass, will you please? Abby, hello. Taking resting lessons? Oh, hello, Stig. Come in. Oh, thanks. You see, Cass, how absurd it is to try to make love to be here? Completely impractical. Oh, hello, Cass. Hello. Oh, uh, did Rod come with you, sir? Yes, he... Um, hello, oh, Abby. Hello, darling, come here. We have a visitor. Oh, Cass. <laughs> oh, how are you? Excuse me, will you? I'm just leaving. Well, for... What's the matter with him? Is this uh, what is known as a situation, Sig? Well, it was in pre-war days. <clears throat> he looked a bit upset, didn't he? Too bad. Cass Worthing is one fellow I always envied for his self-sufficiency. Occasionally he requires cooperation. Does he? I'd better explain the meaning of that innuendo, Rod. You see, when Sig came in the room, he saw Worthing kissing me. But he did it without encouragement. It was not cooperative. <laughs> it's always better to hear these things from your wife and from your best friends. I started to say I envy Worthing. And I envied him even without knowing that Abby kissed him. Well, he kissed Abby. Thank you, Sig. <laughs> well, well, what country started the Great War? Oh, stop chattering, Sig. I envy him because he doesn't worry about anything. Isn't troubled by anything. Never thinks about anything but his own pleasure. I wish I were more like him. I'm glad you're not. Are you? Oh, what time is it? 6.30. Oh, my goodness. I've got to be thinking about getting dressed. <laughs> yes, I have to, I suppose. What time do we dine? 8 o'clock. How delightfully European. Well... Goodbye until then. So long, Sig. Come here, Rod. Is there anything wrong? Not a thing. Why? Now, don't tell Abby. You haven't even kissed me yet. Sorry. All right? Much better. How about you? Completely cured. Not completely, I'm afraid. Have I lost my magic? <laughs> I adore you. Really? And I adore you too, darling. That's so. Anything else? Yes, I adore life, I think. I adore sitting here with you so close to me, waiting to dress for dinner. And you know, Rod, I think of all the people doing the same thing. Famous people, too. Dressing to come here to dine my house with me. I get an awful kick out of it. <laughs> Mrs. Newly Rich. Well, of course. There's nothing in the world so delicious as being a Newly Rich. Well, it has its drawbacks. How? All these famous people of yours who come here to dine. They're not really famous, you know, except among themselves. If you really want to know the truth, there are a lot of chattering mediocrities. Rod. The celebrated Mr. Volishin, for instance. Volishin is your friend, Rod. He's an acquaintance. Well, but you invited him to here before. I didn't expect him to become a habit. Rod, what's the matter with nor you? Nor Dr. Vick, the big specialist from Vienna, nor Mrs. Lampson, the exponent of the new poetry. Oh, nor Rod, Mrs. stop it. If I've invited these people here, it's because I thought it was the thing to do, because I, I, I thought you liked it. Well, him. I don't. Well, I'm sorry, but you could tell me about it without giving me a lecture on it. I didn't mean it like that. Oh, let's not quarrel, Abby, you know... You know, it's like a war. I couldn't survive victory. Neither could I. I don't know what's the matter with me, Abby. The one thing in the world I really want is to make you happy. I guess I'm even a failure at that. No, you're not. I am happy, Rod. Believe me, I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. Oh, darling, I love you. And I love you, Abby. And is it all right now, really? Positively. And you won't be jealous anymore. Jealous? Well, that's what this is all about. Oh, I know. I... But what I told you is true. Worthing kissed me. Do you believe that, Rod? I told you, Abby. I love you. Why did 
did you shut the door, Cass? Because I, I want to talk to you. Now, you shouldn't have come here tonight, Well, Cass. everybody else in town did. And you shouldn't be drinking. Well, what should I be doing? You never were a very successful drinker. Liquor brings you out, unfortunately. Well, I, I, I had no idea of coming here at all. This afternoon when I left you, I said to myself, that's that. I, I called it quits. I, I could have killed you. And what made you forgive me? Oh, I didn't. What happened? Oh, I went around to the club and had a fast workout in the shower. I thought that had fixed me up. Oh, Cass, do you mean to tell me that I survived a fast workout? You did? Oh, I'm flattered. Go on. Oh, Abby, why don't you chuck this pose and be yourself? I'm mad about you, Abby. Crazy mad. Can't you see that? That has a familiar ring, Cass. Oh, you don't believe me. Are you surprised at that? And if I did believe you, it wouldn't make any difference. You're a little late, Cass. Oh, now, now, now listen, Abby. I, I was a fool before, but Abby, listen... Give me another chance. Uh, I'll make it up to you. But I don't want you to make it up to me. Can't you understand that, Cass? Now, come on. Let's go down and dance. Wait, wait. You can't turn me down like this. I'm sorry. Well, when, when, when will I see you? I don't know. Well, will you have lunch with me tomorrow? Well, call me. What, what about late tonight? Oh, it's very difficult. Well, you can do it if you want to. Oh, for an hour. Well, what's the harm in my taking you out for a little drive in the park? All right, perhaps. No, 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 no. Promise. All right, Cass. Well, is it a date? Yes. Now, for pity's sake, let's go down there and ah, dance. Ah, all right. Hello. Oh, hello, Manny. Oh, how are you, Manny? Excuse me, will you? You having a good time, Manny? Okay. It's crowded like the hotsy totsy on Saturday night. Say, you look solemn. What's it all about? Oh, it's about that sore head who just went out. Really? Why? Now, listen, you can't kid me. What's he doing here? Well, it's a big party. I can't keep him from coming to a big party. Well, I don't like it. It's bad business, Abby. No, Manny, it isn't. Abby, Trust me. This Rod is a sweet guy. <laughs> no one knows it as well as I do. Then what are you doing messing around with Worthing? You know what a runaround he gave you in the old days. I seem to remember something of the sort. He's one baby you can't fool with. You know that, don't you? Yes, but I'm better equipped than I used to be. That's why I'm telling you not to worry. Because I'm not worried, Manny. Honest, I'm not. Enjoying our little party, Sig? Hardly. I don't believe you are either. I'm not. I noticed it. You spent most of your time downstairs glaring in the general direction of the handsome polo player. Was it that noticeable? Only to me. You're jealous, aren't you? I can't say that I blame you. It's strange, though. I have flares of rage, flares of indignation, but they don't last. I can't keep it up. Isn't it awful? <laughs> would, would you like to assassinate Worthing? Only momentarily. How does one sustain a hate? I have moments of it when I, when I lose sight of the triviality of this little intrigue, a brief moment of petulance against the whole background of life. And my indignation vanishes. My hate simmers down. That's abnormal, isn't it? To feel like that? What's the matter with me? What, what can I do? You can't do anything. You've either got too much sense to be annoyed or, or too little. Come on, Worthing. Oh, what, what for? You'll see. Will you gentlemen excuse us? Certainly. I won't get up for anybody. I want to talk to Worthing. That's why I got him up here. Well, what, what do you want to talk to me about? You'll find out. Come on, Sig, be a gentleman. You, wait a minute now. You, you, don't, you don't have to go. Whatever Manny's got to say to me, he can say to me here. If you weren't so drunk. Well, what you... if I am drunk? Really, Manny, come on now. He's been saying some foolish things downstairs. Saying them out loud. Why shouldn't he say foolish things out loud if he wants to? Oh, don't be so polite, Dean. You, you know what it's all about. I'm afraid I don't. Well, then I'll tell you. Keep your mouth shut, Worthing. Well, what is this, a convention? Abby, Abby, come here. I, I want to tell him. I want him to know. Well, now, Cass, for heaven's sake. You don't understand. I don't want to be undercover about this. I want him to know. Shut your face. Now, Manny, don't go defending my honor. Well, you might as well know, Dean. Abby and I were pretty good friends once. I'm warning you, Worthing. As a matter of fact, we were a little more than good friends. We were... Manny, don't... Oh. Well, he asked for it. He was just aching for it. I is he dead, Manny? No such luck. Well, that kisser of his won't be so handsome in the morning. Get up, Worthing. You know, Manny, I don't think you should have done that. Though. Oh, shut up. If you had any backbone, you'd have done it yourself. Would I? Are you all right, Manny? Yes, yes, I I'm all right. Well, then, will you tell Rod what you just now said is a lie? Well, what's the difference? We've got a date tonight, haven't we? A date? Oh, Cass. Well, you said you'd meet me. You promised. I'll be waiting for you. I think you'd better leave, Cass. Well, I'll, I'll be waiting at my place. You can call me there. And still the party goes on. Guess I'll go down and uh, see he gets out all right. 
Good night, Abby. Good night. Well, except for a few minor mishaps, it's a very successful party, isn't it? <laughs> Too successful. It's worn me out. Oh, don't go yet, sir. Come on, let's chat. Oh, thanks, my dear, but I'm getting a bit sleepy. Well, then I'll go downstairs with you, sir, because they'll all be leaving pretty soon. Well, it's all over, thank heaven. I've just beaded the last guest. Tired, Rod? A little. Let's get some sleep, shall we? What about your engagement? Engagement? With Cass Worthing. Oh, that. You said you'd promised. Well, I did. It was the only way I knew how uh, to get rid of him. You know, Cass is a little difficult at times. Oh, why don't you keep your engagement? Well, I told you I never meant to. Well, this is nothing then but an exercise in diplomacy? That's all. You don't suspect any other motive? What do you mean? I mean you're still in love with him. I'm not. You are. If you weren't, you wouldn't bother trying to let me down easy. Rod, what are you trying to do? You're making something out of nothing. I treated the whole thing as a joke because the only way I knew I, I could show him how little he meant to me. I appreciate your trying to spare my feelings. Well, you needn't. Perhaps I'm less sensitive than you think. Rod, why do you torture yourself? I don't see it as self-torture. At the moment, it's a rather righteous indignation. Righteous? In spite of your pleas of innocence, the facts seem to disprove you. You were in love with him once and he threw you down. Your kindly treatment at this time seems a bit unwarranted. Perhaps I should disregard what I see. Perhaps I should pass it off as meaningless, trivial. Well, I can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it because you can't see anything except from your own limited viewpoint. I told you I was a failure a long time ago. And I told you about Cass Worthing. And you admit you're still in love with him. I admit nothing. Now, why do you twist my words? Am I on trial? Our marriage is on trial. Everything we were to be to each other is on trial. I remember hoping that you'd give me your love. You mean I haven't? I mean you haven't. Do you... you believe that? Do you really believe that? I do. All right, then. What have you done to deserve it? Just what have you done to deserve it? It takes faith to, to earn love, and you've no more faith in me than you have in yourself. You take everything out in talk. If you had any backbone, when Cass said what he did, you laid him out yourself. Well, you see, I'm cold. I'm heartless. I'm not the emotional type like Manny or yourself. I don't lay people out. I don't think it solves any problems. Oh, I'm sick and tired of hearing about your problems. What are you, anyway? What do you stand for? It's like living with a hypochondriac telling you about his ailments all the time. The truth is, you're ineffectual, and you take it out on me because I'm not. Of course I'm ineffectual. I'm lacking in all the combative instincts. I told you that from the first. But Cass Worthing meets your requirements, doesn't he? Why don't you go to him? Rod. Rod, if you say that again, I will. Go on, why don't you? He's waiting. Do you mean that? I never meant anything so much in my life. You'll... you'll let me go? I urge you. Very well. I will. And that will be that. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Pausing between the scenes of brief moment, our trip to backstage Hollywood finds us face to face with Jimmy Starr, the Hollywood columnist for the Los Angeles Herald Express and other papers. Last fall, Jimmy introduced the novelty of telling film news on this program by means of sound effects. And tonight he has some really unique data on Hollywood. In one fell snoop, he's uncovered the eccentricities of the stars as revealed at the Motor Registration Bureau, where all Hollywood went to secure its automobile license plates for 1938. That's right, Mr. DeMille. Now about these findings, Jimmy. I presume you consulted Mr. R.C. Brewer, manager of the Hollywood office of the Department of Motor Vehicles, whose collection of signatures on registration cards is the envy of every autograph hunter. I did, and it is. After looking at the card signed by Joan Crawford, I learned she wanted to have the letter C on her license plates surrounded by sevens. Jack Oakey wants number 54, because 54 is the number of films in which he's appeared. 
Cary Grant wants his street address on his license plate so that it reads backwards or from left to right. Possibly so he can send the car home by itself. <laughs> car owners frequently return plates for exchange if they find the numbers add up to 13. On the other hand, there's Lily Pons, who really wants 13. And George Burns wanted a number under three for Gracie Allen. So she wouldn't strain our memory, huh? Eh? Uh, tell me, have you any new news sound effects for us? Yes, I have. See if you can figure this one out. I, I give up. Well, that's Bing Crosby's new baby getting his first crooning lesson. <laughs> now this. Sounds like, uh, like a limb breaking from a tree. You're getting hot. It's really Charlie McCarthy taking a wrestling lesson. <laughs> See if you can interpret this one. That's your version of an exciting newsreel condensed into five seconds. Oh, no. That's just a certain wardrobe director in town sending forth his troop of errand boys. But why all the confusion? You'll give people the wrong idea. Well, that wardrobe director's in a spot. He really has 200 costumes to freshen up for the next day's shooting, and, and gosh... Go on, go on. And he's all out of Lux Flakes. Oh, <laughs> oh that's different. <laughs> and so are Lux Flakes different, Mr. DeMille. If the opinions of the leading studios in Hollywood mean anything, and believe me, they do, Lux is tops all over town. Proceed, Mr. Starr. Any more? Yes, here's another. Mm, that, uh, that's a strange sound for California, but I've got it. A radiator letting off steam. Another zero. That's Ben Burney saying hello to Walter Winchell. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, from now on, you'd better tell your news in English, if you have any left. Of course. Here are four snappy snoops. Thumbdom Flash number one, D.W. Griffith, who has announced plans of remaking his greatest film, The Birth of a Nation. But there's a big hitch in the idea. No one can find an original script of the opus, and that's causing a long delay. Number two, a new all-time record for climbing walls took place at the Warner Brothers studio when a bull became infuriated on the cowboy from Brooklyn set, broke loose and proceeded to scatter stars and crew in all directions. Dick Powell, Pat O'Brien, Dick Ferran broke all speed records, it is claimed. Director Lloyd Bacon's flaming shirt was the cause of the bull's sudden outburst. <laughs> Item number three. For several weeks, Betty Davis has been awaiting some of California's unusual weather. In fact, Betty wanted a heavy downpour of rain. The small cloudburst arrived last Friday. Betty called the moving vans, moved into her new home at the height of the rainstorm. Sounds a bit peculiar, but Betty believes that the rain brings her luck. She got her first stage engagement, her first break at Universal and met her husband, Harmon O. Nelson, each during a rainstorm. News note number four. Shirley Temple's new musical, Little Miss Broadway, was delayed this morning while the tiny star, with tears streaming down her cheeks, conducted a burial service over six of her pet bunny rabbits, drowned in a rainstorm last night. But true to the tradition of the theater, the show must go on. Shirley dried her tears and with a heavy heart returned to work this afternoon. As a climax, I'd like to tell one last item about the auto licenses. A certain star, I'd rather not mention his name, returned his plates, stating that he couldn't use them on his car. One question, he stated that he believed in astrology and that the numbers on his plates didn't vibrate properly. He was asked what kind of a car he drove, and he replied that it was a 1929 model of a popular make. That ought to vibrate enough for you, replied the attendant. <laughs> and I think I've vibrated enough myself. So long, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> thank you. Uh, right, Charles right. We want to start to here tonight, so thank you, Jimmy. Back to our play, Brief Moment, with Ginger Rogers, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., and our all-star cast. It's the following day. In a hotel dining room, Abby is having lunch with Manny Walsh, telling him of her quarrel with Rod... She pauses for a moment, biting her lip. Well, go on. So I left him, Manny. I had to after that for my own self-respect, I had to. And then I... 
I called you. Oh, you shouldn't have done it, Abby. You, you shouldn't have walked out on him. But he told me to. Sure he did, because he couldn't see straight. He was too sore. I don't believe that. Well, why didn't he get sore when Cass said what he did? I don't know. Maybe he was. You can't tell, Abby. Some guys are just, well, they're, they're built that way. No, that's no, all. no. He just doesn't care, Manny. I don't seem to have much luck, do I? I'm practically left at the church by someone I think I love. And the man I know I love, well... You ought to call him. Oh, I can't, Manny. I can't. He's got to call me. And if he don't? I don't know, Manny. I don't know. Would you mind telling me why? Why what? Why all the plans for departure? From the looks of the place I came in, I should say that you were leaving shortly. I am. Practically all packed. Where are you going? Europe. Oh, that's nice. Very broadening, they tell me. Why? Would you like three guesses, Sig? Couldn't have anything to do with Abby, I suppose. <laughs> I hear that she's going to marry Cass Worthing. You know all the gossip, don't you? <laughs> I read the columns. They've been carrying for the last three weeks. I still don't see how your going to Europe solves anything. Well, if I told you why, you'd probably think I was crazy. How do you know I don't think so, anyway? Sig, I'm going to make an experiment. What, again? Yes, again. Well? I figured it all out the last two weeks. I'm sick of life. Hardly sick of it. Because it isn't my life at all. It's a carbon copy of hundreds of other parasitic lives around me. I want to discover my place in the world. How are you going to do it? Well, as a necessary first step, a stimulus to future endeavor, I've, I've given up all my money. You've done what? I've left myself barely enough to live on. Not too comfortable at that. Who did you give the money to? <laughs> well, that was amusing. Having, having decided to give away this considerable fortune, I found that I wasn't equipped even to be generous. I finally had to give it to a group of specialists who'll decide what to do with it. It was my first contact with the contemporary world. A group of specialists. Well, well, well. I expect people will say I'm eccentric. You put it mildly, yes. And now what? Now I'm free. Maybe I've been wrong, Sig. Maybe you've got to fight for things in order to appreciate them. Well, now I can. And maybe the joy isn't in having at all. Maybe it's just in the fighting. I'm going to find out. I assume that you've chosen a starting point. Yes, I have. Just a minute. Hello, Worthing. Well, Dean, well, what do you want here? Worthing, a few weeks ago you said something I didn't like. I want you to tell me now it was a lie. Do you? Well, I'm afraid I can't. Then I'm sorry for you. Oh. Hello? Hello, Sig. Yeah? This is Abby. Oh, hello. Have you seen the papers, Sig? Yes. Did he really do it? Did Rob really do it? Oh, yes. Oh, I can hardly believe it. It doesn't sound like him at all. Oh, he's changed. You wouldn't know him. Who is it? Shh. Who is it? Reporter. Hello? Oh, Sig. Sig, I, I want to see you. What for? Oh, I don't know. I just, I just want to talk to you. When? Anytime. Maybe tonight at dinner. <laughs> Very well. At seven, the Plaza Circle. Very well. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who was that? I told you, reporters, they've been trying to get you at your place, so no answer, so they, they called here. They wanted your picture. You should have given it to them. Do you mean to tell me that you're proud of your ruffian tactics? <laughs> I guess I am a little. If any bird ever deserved it, he was it. <laughs> Rod. What? You have become a muscle man. You ought to have someone to look after you now. Thanks. No telling what, what a little success in that line can do to a person. I'll look after myself for a while. When are you sailing? Nine o'clock. You're absolutely set on it? Yes. What about dinner tonight? A sort of uh, farewell party, just you and I. Mm, if you want. Good. Shall we say the plaza circle at, at seven? This way, monsieur. A table for three, you said? No, that's right, Pierre. Three? Sig, what's the idea? Oh, well, here we all are. Good evening, Abby. Oh, Sig, why did you do it? If you'll excuse me, my children, I've got a very important telephone with me to make. Uh, can I leave you alone for a minute? 
I, um... Uh, I suppose he'll know this... This isn't my idea. I hope you don't think it was mine. I'm glad, in a way. I... I probably would have called you this evening. Really? I... I just wanted to thank you. You've, you've changed me, Abby. Yes, I read something about it in the papers. Oh, it's deeper than that. I'm a new man, Abby. Free of the past. Free for the future. I've given up all my money. I suppose you've heard that. No, I hadn't. Does it matter? Well, it does to me. I have a new outlook on things. A brand new perspective. I'm not even sorry that things turned out as they did. We'd never been happy together. Not really. Because I was trying to draw strength from you, Abby. And you can't do that. It's... It's got to come from inside. Well, I... I think I have that strength now. I think I can be happy. And I'm... I'm so grateful to you, Abby. I hope that you'll be happy, too. <laughs> Is it funny? <laughs> yes, very. When I first heard of your going to Cass's place, I thought there was a reason behind it. I thought maybe you wanted to prove to me that you did think enough of me to defend my name. <laughs> Now I find out you did it all for your own amusement. To prove to yourself that you were really a man. I had to. The night we parted, you said things to me. You said weakling, hypochondriac, ineffectual. Those things rang in my ears. I'll, I'll never forget what you said to me that night. And I'll never forget what you said to me that night. You weren't interested. You sent me to Cass. And you went, didn't you? You went. No, I didn't. You told me to go, but I didn't. What? No, not to Cass. I went to a hotel. Manny knew where. I told him not to tell you until you asked for me. And I waited for you to call a week, two weeks, three weeks. You didn't call. I said, this isn't control. This is anemia. Oh, Rod, don't you see? I can't spend the... Oh, rest Abby. Of oh, what a fool I was. What a fool I am. What a jealous, overbearing fool. Oh, forgive me, Abby. You say you've changed. All right, then. Do you have faith in me now? Do you believe me when I tell you that... that you've always had my love? That you've had it ever since we were married? That, that I never did love Cass Worthing? That I haven't even thought of him? Have you that faith? Yes, Abby. I do believe you. And deep down, I suppose I always have believed you. I'm sorry. And I love you, Abby. I love you. Oh, Rod. Hello, I'm not in the way, am I? Oh, Sig. Do you know what's just happened? But I think I can guess. You we... better hurry, Rod. The boat sails in about ten minutes. The boat? What boat? Rod's, Abby. Going, Rod's going to Europe, Abby. Best thing in the world for him. I tried to talk him out of it, but I can see that he's right. I saw it as a chance to fight alone, Abby. Away from everything. And everybody? Oh, not everybody. I'm going with him. What? What? I just bought a ticket. Come along, come along. We'll be late. Wait, Abby. Abby, if only no, no, you'd no, be able... No, 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 you, you'd better go, Rod. Maybe it is the best thing. If it's going to be good for you, I... I want you to take it. Goodbye, Rod. Oh, of course it's the best way. Somebody's got to take care of him. Will you please shut up? What? Stop trying to order my life for me. I know what I'm doing. You know you mean you're not going to Europe? I am going to Europe, and Abby's going with me. Oh, Rod, I love you. Give me that ticket you bought for you. No, look here. Come on, give it to me. I was looking forward to this trip. Now get away from here. We'll write you about it. I've got it, Abby. Come on. Come you on. can't do this to me. That's my ticket. Oh, it's mine now, Sig. Goodbye, Kevin. It, it, it's robbery. So long, Sig. You you can't do this to me. To me, your your very best friend. You you ought to be ashamed. Pierre. Uh, dinner for three, sir. No, just one. Oh. Oh, Pierre. Eh? You know, I thought just now for a moment that I was stuck with a ticket for Europe. Our brief moment is gone. Melville Roick has something to say on behalf of our sponsors, and then Ginger Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. will take a curtain call. Mr. Roick. Here it is. A fact that may amaze even those who are experts on the subject, the housewives of our audience. It is estimated that the average woman who keeps house for her family spends 546 hours a year washing dishes. That's nearly 23 entire days of 24 hours each or more than three solid weeks without a second off duty. 
Imagine what all those hours can do to your hands if you slip into the mistake of doing dishes with ordinary harsh soaps. You wouldn't wash your hands with a laundry soap, yet that takes but a minute while your hands are in the dishpan for hours. Why not guard their beauty while you're doing the dishes? Simply use Lux Flakes. Lux doesn't dry out the oils of the skin, doesn't leave your hands with that rough, sandpapery feeling, that red dishpan look. It keeps them white and lovely. It's inexpensive, too. Buy the economical big box. For beauty's sake, always wash your dishes with Lux Flakes. Now, Mr. DeMille. And now the pair who made a very happy hour of a brief moment, Miss Rogers and Mr. Fairbanks. It's the customary thing when a play is over to retire to some inviting rendezvous for a cup of tea and a dance or two. <laughs> Suppose, Miss Rogers, we put down our tea and uh, kick the big apple around? <laughs> <laughs> Splendid, but I couldn't think of making Mr. Fairbanks a wallflower. Oh, Miss Rogers, let me assure you that the sight of Mr. DeMille doing the big apple will be well worth the price of solitude. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting words, Mr. Fairbanks. Fighting words. I'll have you know that Please, I... gentlemen... Well, the last time you were here, Doug, I heard Mr. DeMille say that he's known you and watched you ever since you were a little blossoming sprig on the Fairbanks family tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll have no part in anything that might shatter such a long friendship. Well, what'll we do? <laughs> Sit down, hold hands? <laughs> say, Miss eh? well, Rogers, may I have this chance? <laughs> <laughs> Keep that up, Mr. F., and we will be calling for spirits of ammonia. Oh, I'll be calling for my car. <laughs> Where are you going, Mr. DeMille? paradise. Oh. Hey, what goes on here in here? You both are talking like a couple of fugitives from a heavenly choir. Shh. Paradise is the name of Mr. DeMille's ranch. If you keep quiet, he's liable to invite us there. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. Well, well, it sounds like the chorus from the last round up to me. Um, you won't be lonesome up there, will you, Mr. DeMille? No, no, I have the peacocks and the deer. Well, I, uh, I play the piano a bit. I know a few stories and I'm a pretty good listener. Well, the peacocks and the deer are very nice. <laughs> Wait a moment. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll invite you both to my house instead. Douglas and I will have tea, and for you, Mr. DeMille, well, for you, we'll have a nice bowl of Lux Flakes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the cream, Ginger. They're really delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and every time you open your mouth to speak, there won't be words, there'll just be bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> like Dopey and Snow White. <laughs> and he's doing all right for himself, yeah. too. <laughs> You know, gentlemen, we certainly can talk without saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't it the truth? <laughs> if, there, if there's something really important on your mind, Ginger, why, uh, just, just speak right up. Say it. <laughs> well, here it is. I want you to know, Mr. DeMille, that I've had a grand time here tonight, and I hope we'll all meet again soon in front of this very same microphone. Good night. Good night, CB, and mind your P's and Susie Q's. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Rogers and Mr. Fairbanks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Rook. Before Mr. DeMille tells you of next week's gala program, may I say our stars tonight were assisted by Grace Kern as Gertie, Inez Seabury as Mabel, David Kerman as Frank, Mary Smith as a sales lady, James Eagles as chef, Lou Merrill as irate customer, and Frank Nelson as gossip columnist. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for the new film in Old Chicago. For the same studio, Nigel Bruce has recently made the picture... The Baroness and the Butler. And now, Mr. DeMille. For those who enjoy a simple yet finely woven drama of honest sentiment will welcome the Lux Radio Theater adaptation next Monday night of one of the most touching love stories ever told, Romance, by Edward Sheldon. Thousands of people crowded the theater week after week to see it as a play with Doris Keene and William Courtney. It played over a thousand performances in London, and no less brilliant was its record on the screen. We celebrate its presentation on the radio by bringing you two of your favorite performers, two of Hollywood's most famous stars, Miss Madeline Carroll and Mr. Herbert Marshall. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Herbert Marshall and Madeline Carroll in Romance. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.